So the April 12th meeting of the Faculty Senate will come to order. Welcome everyone, we do have a quorum. Before we start the meeting, I have just a few reminders about meeting procedure. After each presentation or report, senators will have the opportunity to ask questions or offer comments. Senators may speak or they may use the chat. Uh, senators who raise their hand to speak will be recognized first. To raise your hand, click on the hand raise icon that appears at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see that hand raise icon, then you can click on participants also at the bottom of your screen and you should be able to raise your hand from there. Please wait to be recognized before you speak. And then when you are recognized, please announce your first and last name in your college. According to Robert's rules, senators are permitted to speak up to two times on any one motion. If a motion is on the floor and a senator has already been recognized twice, they will not be recognized for a third time. And uh, lastly, senators and panelists, if you are, are not speaking, please mute your microphones. So our first order of business is the approval of the minutes from our March 8th Senate meeting. Those minutes have been distributed as an annex in your agenda. Uh, is, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes from the March meeting? Hearing no corrections, the minutes are approved as written. So we shall move on to our report from President Gee. President Gee, are you ready? Thank you very much, Natalie. I appreciate it and uh, welcome everyone. Um, I might just note that I was listening to that wonderful music and uh, I'm glad that Natalie um, gave us the uh, lineup that was terrific. Uh, today, by the way, marks the 50th anniversary of the release of John Denver's single called uh, Bring Me Home Country Road, so April 12th. So I just thought that I'd wow you with a little bit of information here. Um, <clears throat> let me just say that uh, the legislative session finished on Saturday at, at midnight and uh, I think that uh, my overall characterization of the session was that it was tumultuous um, and uh, that, um, that uh, it was difficult to navigate, uh, particularly I think because of the fact that uh, we were doing a lot of this long distance as you, those of you who've been, ever been involved in the legislative process knows a lot of it is based upon conversations that take place and uh, and meetings in the hallways and a variety of other things. There was very little of that that we could do because of two reasons. One, because of the mandates uh, of, the, of the virus. But in addition, um, you know, the, the, um, the capital is undergoing extensive renovations. The dome was in serious, uh, was in serious shape and so they've, they have really closed off much of the capital for periods of time. And, uh, and then on top of it, uh, we didn't get a chance to do our county tours and meetings with our legislative uh, friends. And uh, so it was, it, was, uh, uh, it was a challenging session, no doubt about it. Saying that, we did fine. And um, uh, let me just say that, the, the, first of all, on the budget, um, some of you read that, uh, the university had had been cut eighteen million dollars. We had not been cut. They moved, they moved um, eighteen million dollars of our base budget to the surplus side of the equation. But we have every assurance that if if and when the surplus uh, doesn't appear, that that will be moved back into the regular budget. It was really an accounting issue that they have. So, uh, but we did take a one and a half percent, as I call it, a haircut, um, and. Uh, and, and it's a goodwill haircut more than anything else because of the fact that um, truthfully, um, there are certain members of both the House and the Senate that wanted to cut us a lot, uh, but we have a lot of friends and uh, we were able to rally and make certain that that did not take place. Um, but um, we have a lot of work to do um, to explain the position of the university. Uh, they value and appreciate us. Let me just say that they value and appreciate us. But, but you know, in a divided world in which we're now operating, 
Um, I was told by a senior, one of the key senior leaders that, uh, you know, our position on Black Lives Matter, uh, the Blue Lives Matter uh, issue that arose, some of the other things uh, that, that happen. Um, uh, when you deal in a, in a single issue context, um, as we are dealing in this nation right now, anything can inflame people, even though they recognize the value and value the good work you're doing. So I think that Rob Alsop and Travis Mollahan and Rocco Facilio, who represent us, um, are about as good as they get. Uh, we, we have always, uh, over the last several years, uh, People in the legislature will tell you that we are the we are as well or better represented than any particular entity in the state, and um, I, I and 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 for that I'm grateful. A couple of other things we did uh, we did uh, fend off um, campus carry again um, by one vote, and uh, we did fend off. Uh, uh, them removing uh, fifteen million dollars from the uh, by uh, negating the pop tax for the academic medical center uh, by one vote, uh, you, you can tell we're running on we're running on uh, slim margins here. And uh, but we have uh, we have some very moderate Republican senators, particularly who uh, continue to carry a great. Uh, Wait and uh, certainly work very closely with us. So I think that we, I think that um, we did do well, um, at particularly on the bills themselves. Uh, there are a number of ones that had a particular uh, aspect to them that were not necessarily uh, in best interest of the university. We did, um, we did uh, rally and uh, get most of those taken care of. Um, saying that, and I'll, and I'll be able to answer any questions that maybe you may have, I just want to note a couple of other things. First of all, Ascend West Virginia, which is our remote worker program, was announced today, um, received a lot of great uh, attention, both nationally and, uh, and publicly. Uh, that is where uh, we'll offer remote workers a $12,000 incentive to move to um, West Virginia and enjoy a year's worth of free outdoor recreation by Leveraging, of course, our outdoor um, recreation assets, this program will bring a lot of fresh talent to the state. Um, Brad Smith and his wife, who Brad is the chairman and chief executive officer of Intuit and is a West Virginian from Canova, West Virginia. Um, uh, um, he and his wife gave $25 million, which has been matched uh, by the state to create the Brad and Lee Smith Outdoor Economic Development Collaborative. Um, at 25 million and that the collaborative was given to the university. Um, our governor has been very engaged in this process. We think it along with, um, with several of the other opportunities that we have, uh, such as uh, the Virgin Hyperloop, our Vantage Ventures, uh, our FinTech Sandbox. Uh, this is reflecting the entrepreneurial led approach our university has taken to drive economic development. We are embracing innovation and uh, engaging with those whose eyes are cast to the future. Um, finally, um, I would really encourage any faculty member who has not yet received a vaccination to do so as soon as possible. Um, we have vaccines available and we uh, would hope and, and indeed I would say that it is an act of kindness for every one of our faculty and staff to uh, to be uh, vaccinated. Um, the issue about whether we'll require vaccinations for our students when they return in the fall, that is still something that our, our health folks are talking about um, um, and how we would manage that. And obviously if we require, uh, if we require every student to have, um, have uh, a vaccine, we'll require every faculty and staff member to also. So, I just want to I just want to encourage all of you to make sure you take um, take the vaccine. As you know, the the UK variant is now prevalent in this country, and um, and uh, the the South African variant is uh, is increasing, and that has um, that that has some 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 different um, some different um, impacts on. Um, on people of different ages. So I just want to make certain that everyone understands that we are very uh, 
encouraged by the fact that we have these vaccines and we're very encouraged by people taking them. Natalie, um, I'm open for questions now. Questions for President Gee? Okay, hearing no questions, we will move on to our report from Provost Reed. Thank you, Natalie. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm gonna start out talking about a few COVID-19 updates. Um, first of all, vaccines. Um, I'm gonna follow up on what President Gee said, uh, was I think two months ago that we talked and we were uh, talking about that there were limited vaccines and uh, for anyone who was under the age of 50 and now uh, the university and the state are awash with vaccines. Um, there is a lot of, a lot of product right now um, to be used. And so right now, uh, WVU, any employee um, and any student can get a vaccine um, 18 years and older. So um, we're, we're uh, really um, interested in getting our students vaccine. 11,000 of them indicated they want the vaccine. And um, WVU is now accepting walk-ins during Wednesday's vaccination clinic at the rec center. Again, for faculty, students, and staff, um, we're now administering the J&J &J vaccine, which is a single dose, um, and you have to be 18 years old to, to get that vaccine. Um, also, those clinics are gonna be open to the public. So you could actually bring your entire family to get vaccinated. Um, but a priority will be given to those WVU employees who have registered, uh, employees and students who've registered um, in the BAM system. Um, let's see, May commencement. We are actually, as you know, going to have an in-person commencement this May um, and a few details on that. Uh, as they become clear, it will be, again, four in-person um, ceremonies held between uh, on May 15th and May 16th. It'll be held in the stadium at 25% capacity, um, and students will receive a number of tickets. I don't know if we've announced yet that number, but that will be information will be forthcoming. The students will be seated in the stands as opposed to the, um, the field, and so they will be seated in... Um, where the uh, opposing bands uh, typically play, you know, that corner of the, of the field. Um, and so there'll be security there to ensure that there is social distancing between families. Only students who are pre-registered will be allowed uh, to participate. So we cannot allow any walk-ons this year. And, and students who just show up and their families, unfortunately, will have to be turned away because of the safety precautions. Um, May 20th, December 20th, and May 21st graduates will be, um, will be invited to participate. And we will be um, giving our honorary degree candidates their, uh, their degrees um, this May, including those that were nominated last year. Patrice Harris, who is a three-time graduate of WVU and the first uh, Black woman president of the American Medical Association, will be the speaker at all four ceremonies. And more information will be available through your college's uh, commencement coordinator. So uh, the provost office will be extending the COVID-19 emergency child care program. And this was for faculty um, who, who um, had some extraordinary child care needs. And we're extending those through the summer. And I'd like Melissa Latimer to just say a few words about that. Sure. Um, after I tell you about it, I'm going to drop the link uh, into the chat so that people can access it. So as you know, we've been offering um, funding to, to provide um, to offset the cost of childcare. And we originally prioritized teaching. What we'd like to do this summer, starting May 11th, is expand the, that funding to cover essentially any area where the faculty member is expected to make significant contributions. So what that means then is that faculty in total can get $1,000 between the time that we've started it. So it's not like the clock starts over. So if you've already tapped into those funds um, and say used 500, you would still be eligible for 500 more. So this is to cover childcare funding. Uh, if you needed to teach your summer course or prepare for your fall courses, if you needed to focus on research because you were un unable to do that this past academic year due to COVID, 
Uh, that's for untenured faculty, uh, or if you have to complete significant service obligations. So the information uh, in terms of how you qualify, what some examples are, and the link to actually apply for the funding is at the Women's Resource Center website, just like it has been, but it's now been updated. Uh, if you need uh, time to deliver a course, if you need time to go to the office to record lectures without interruptions, if you need time to read the text and update your lectures, uh, travel to conduct research, to covering childcare for all of these things, time to go to the office to write up your research or to do a significant service assignment, um, that's what this funding is for. And it's a first come first serve and we have a, um, a certain amount of money set aside. Thanks a lot, Melissa. It's great. Yeah, I'm so glad we can continue that. We do have a foundation fund um, that we were able to tap into, and we think it's really important to do what we can to support our faculty um, who have child care needs and who have really been struggling this past year. Um, summer boot camp updates. So um, as you may recall, in February, some uh, I think it was Amy Hessel brought up one of the senators about concerns about students, high school students coming to WVU in the fall who had a, a strange COVID year of, um, of instruction and uh, the concern that they might not be prepared for college. And so um, Evan Witters um, in our office put together a small committee that developed a uh, pilot for this summer boot camp uh, course that we're going to offer this summer. Um, just a few details about it. Uh, we're going to prioritize freshman admits from counties in West Virginia who have uh, lower retention rates, basically uh, students who are, you know, who are struggling and disadvantaged. It is a three week term um, offered during the last weeks of the second summer session. It's cheap. It's $25 a credit. We're offering several, I'd say a small variety of GEF courses. Um, and these courses will be offered online because we found it really was cost prohibitive, even at a discounted rate for students to be physically here for three weeks before the start of the semester. There will be success coaches embedded in the courses and, um, and the group is planning a variety of cohort building activities for the students when they get to campus a few days before the semester starts. So again, this is a pilot. Um, it was a great idea. I was so glad we could act on it quickly and we will see um, we will see what the results of that are and if we want to replicate it and grow it next year. A few academic updates. Finals week, as a reminder, uh, runs from Tuesday, May 4th through Saturday, May 8th. Um, and a reminder also that it is Ramadan. And so you, uh, we're urging our faculty to be flexible during the week, knowing that, that some of our Muslim students may indeed be uh, fasting and not drinking anything. And so, um, you know, uh, particularly stressed during that week. Um, an update on summer school. We have a, so far a 5% increase in enrollments, which um, we're very pleased about. Um, we were concerned that we would not have an increase because May Mester is also um, taking off like gangbusters. We have 385 students in May Mester, but um, I think our students are eager to um, really to move through their, their courses and to, to um, be back in school. Um, again, and not necessarily in their parents' basements, as Gordon likes to say. Um, our enrollment for the fall is slightly down overall at the university, although it's holding steady. And, and really the challenge just to share with you all, um, and I'm not our enrollment expert, but uh, my understanding is that our in-state enrollment has been down somewhat because the students haven't been able to apply for promise because they haven't been able to take the ACT test which is a requirement for promise, but that's opening up now. And uh, we at WVU are actually offering, um, I think at, between our campus and Beckley and Kaiser, six different times that we're gonna be offering the ACT. So that, that should be moving as well. Briefly wanna talk about academic transformation. So that process continues to move forward. President Gee and I um, together attended the mostly um, faculty, mostly faculty advisory committee meeting earlier this month. Um, you know, the president explaining or reiterating why we're doing it and the urgency for doing this. And I talked about a bit about how we're doing it, providing an updated timeline and process for the program portfolio review part of academic transformation. 
And again, that is um, helping us to identify academic programs that we would uh, either want to grow, reduce, and or sunset. So that timeline and process has been updated on the academic transformation website. Um, at that meeting, we also explained that we are gonna slow things down a little bit to ensure that the um, units, those, those units and the faculty that, that may be affected by this will have time to respond. Um, but I do wanna emphasize this is a different process than the five-year BOG program review process. Um, this is a more accelerated process um, and it is one in which we are carefully adhering to BOG policy, but we're not we're, we are not necessarily following all of our standard practices for five-year review, again, because of that accelerated timeline. Um, I believe this is going to be a two-year process because, frankly, um, we got off to a late start because the data has been so hard to gather. It lives in so many different places, um, and our chief New chief data officer, not so new, Lisa Castellino, um, has done an incredible job bringing order um, and consistency to the data. Um, and so uh, we're, we are now at a place where we can start to move on that. Um, I do wanna say we, we wanna be as transparent as possible. Um, we're not trying to hide anything, um, but we do believe that the units that are potentially impacted should be the first to know about it. Um, rather than the advisory committee and faculty senate. And, and I think we all agree that, that um, those, those people who are directly affected need to know first what might be happening. Again, we are gonna be following a very um, detailed process. Um, we will give faculty time to respond. Um, and, uh, and for that reason, we are, we are uh, expecting that we would not be making recommendations until um, early October to the Board of Governors. All right, that's it on, uh, oh, and then the next step, sorry, the next steps are to bring the committee, that advisory committee updated information on the process and timelines for academic restructuring and instructional inefficiencies, uh, inefficiency, efficiencies, which are um, also a part of academic transformation, and then to seek the committee's input on those efforts. Um, switching gears quite a bit. Um, April brings spring flowers and showers and sometimes all in one day, but it is also the season of celebration. Uh, this is the, the month where we honor and recognize our students and faculty for their academic achievements. Um, something new, tomorrow is uh, the WVU Academic Advising Council and Office of the Provost are launching a new annual event to recognize our outstanding academic advisors. And some of you are probably on this call uh, because we do have faculty advisors. As part of the new Advisor Appreciation Day, students, faculty, and staff have been asked to show their support and appreciation for individual academic advisors whom they think are making a difference. We have, there's a fabulous webpage on the Academic Advising Council's website. It shows um, how to do that, some fun facts about our advising, um, our advisors, um, including that there's a really large percentage of satisfaction with, with our advising, and then some great quotes from students about their advisors, really inspiring. And I do want to say that, again, I know we have some of you, uh, some of our faculty or advisors, that our advisors do yeoman's work under any circumstance, but this year was particularly challenging for our students during COVID, and um, their work is really appreciated. Research Week kicks off today with a number of events that celebrate our faculty and their research contributions. Research Week is sponsored by um, our office and the, uh, uh, the research office at WVU. Our first event is our second virtual long form scholarship celebration and that is hosted on our Provost Office website. And if you haven't checked it out already, I encourage you all to look at it. Um, there's some really outstanding contributions from from your colleagues across campus. And again, some of this work came out in the, the time of COVID, which is particularly impressive. And there are a number of events scheduled that are being held at the university level, but also at the departmental level. Uh, this month you will hear, uh, this is when we are going to be announcing the winners of our University Teaching Research and Service Awards as well. So stay tuned for that. And then finally, just as a fun note, um, I encourage you all to check out the university's 
refresh series, which has been extended to faculty and staff. And just to give you an idea of some of the cool things coming up, um, they have a session on how to pick your perfect family outdoor adventure trip, now that it is getting safer to travel, um, how to use some of our excellent mountain bike trails, and then uh, one that I'm particularly excited about, the Dory Greenspan Dinner Party on April 23rd. I don't know if any of you all know, but Dory Greenspan is a renowned chef and she's a, like an award-winning cookie baker and she's one of my idols. Um, and so if you want to sign up for that, uh, you've got to do it. It's first come, first serve. And then you pick up your meal supplies in those refresh, you know, those, I don't know what you call them, containers um, or stands or whatever you want to call them, modules um, around campus. So um, that is my report now. Are there uh, questions for Provost Reed? I see questions in the chat, but I'm gonna let the folks who wanna ask their questions orally do that first. So I see one from Asad Davari, go ahead. Um, Asad Davari from Berkeley campus. I was just wondering the uh, child care funding that's set aside, does it apply to all campuses or is it only for main campus? All campuses. Thanks. Sure. Uh, okay, Frankie, I see your hand. Go ahead, Frankie Tack. Yeah, Frankie Tack, College of Education and Human Services. Um, I was just wondering from Provost Reed how the how the stadium seating is going to be for faculty, and what happens in the event of rain. Well, <laughs> hi, Frankie. Um, I can tell you, in, 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 in the event of rain, we will still be having commencement. So get those little hats with the umbrellas on them. You know, those really classy looking hats. Um, I, I don't have the details on how faculty are going to be seated with students or, uh, you know, in their own sections, but I know that whoever the college, um, the college's commencement coordinator, they should be sharing that information. Okay, so, so um, Frankie, I would check with the dean's office. Thank you. Yep. Other questions for the provost before we get into the ones in the chat? Yes, Parviz, go ahead. Hi, uh, Parviz Famuri, Statler College. Um, again, thank you for all you guys are doing, okay, during this. So I went through the, um, the website that you told me on transformation, and I know um, you're, you're doing it, you and, uh, I mean, the administration is doing it to put us in a better position in the future. And we all agree with that. And to attract more future students to our campuses because everybody knows now, or everybody's predicting that the Ivy League schools are gonna survive and the land grant students are gonna survive and thrive. And people wanna go to those places. So from your goals, why don't we have sustainability as part of our goal? So that we have a sustainable campus, more green. I know we're in coal con country, but still most of our students are coming from region. And I don't know what's the latest on percentage, but uh, I'm just, you know, it's, it's something to think about. I think we need to move in, in that direction of sustainability, green, um, and, 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 and um, because the, you know, the kids in the future, that's what, that's one thing they're gonna excite them too. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you, Parviz. What I would say to you is, is that, that, um, this effort that, that, that we're talking about now is academic transformation. So it's really looking at um, our academic offerings. Uh, so I would suggest that um, as part of this, that academic units look at what they're offering in terms of curriculum around sustainability. Um, and you know, we can help do some market research on, on program ideas that you might have. We're, we're, we are internally doing a gap analysis where we're looking at um, majors that we or and degree programs that we don't currently offer that are in demand. But again, I think it's, I think on on the curriculum side, it's you know really can come from the faculty. You know, what are those new areas uh, around sustainability that would be really exciting for students? 
So I'm, I'm sorry, then, then uh, okay, so again, I'm missing the point as usual. I, I didn't know it was just academic, but what I'm, I'm, what I'm talking about is yes. campus. We're talking about right. our campus. I mean, we have PRT, that's, that's a, one of the best example of sus sustainability and transportation. I'm talking about the campus as a whole, not the, yeah, thank I you. It's, it's a really good point and, um, and something we need to take into account for the future, truly. I asked somebody from the sustainability uh, committee to speak, the Senate Sustainability Committee. I, uh, Andrea, I see your comment in the chat, but I don't know if you or Sean want to say something. Yes, it was a great comment. And, uh, and actually, we uh, spent uh, quite a bit of time discussing this in committee today. So uh, we're actually uh, working through. Uh, everyone should have just uh, had the opportunity to uh, to respond to a survey that we put together, uh, the committee, uh, and uh, we're finalizing results on that and and uh, looking to, to bring a motion forward to uh, to Senate to uh, to go over our commitment to sustainability here at the next uh, hopefully by the May, the May uh, session, so. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. Okay, there was uh, um, Asad, I'm gonna, uh, gonna let you go one more time and then I see um, Drew Nix is next. So Asad, go ahead. Thanks, Asad from uh, Berkeley campus. When you talk about sustainability, academic sustainability, what do you mean by that? Are you, referring to the enrollment, the number of student or ratio of faculty student, and what is the sustainability of a program in academic uh, sense? Um, what I meant, Asad, was programs that, that have a focus on sustainability as a, as a content area. That's what I meant. Thank you. Okay, Drew, next, go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, so I had thrown this up in the chat, but I don't think anybody saw it. And I don't know why my video is not working here. Oh, there we go. Um, so uh, Provost Reed, I may have misheard this, but when you started out your discussion earlier, uh, I thought you said something about vaccinations for family members of faculty, is that correct? Right. Yeah. So um, I know there was a lot of content. Um, yeah. So Andrew, um, it's first come first serve. I mean, it's it, you can come. Anybody can come to the clinic on Wednesday or clinics on Wednesday, and that includes faculty, faculty members, families. So um, does it have to be over eighteen? You have to be over eighteen because okay, that, that's what I wanted to clarify. It's the J and J vaccine, which you have to be over okay. eighteen. Yeah, because my my oldest has already been vaccinated because of health reasons. He's seventeen. My my youngest aren't old enough, so I, I wanted to check on that. So yeah, no, yeah, that J and J has a requirement of eighteen. Yep. Okay, all right. Thank you so much. Yep, no problem. There's one more question in the chat. Let me see if I can find it. And this one is for President Gee, and it's about the legislative session. So it's um, how will the tax change in West Virginia affect WVU? So that's for the president. Uh, yeah, I uh, the, the the tax bill failed it imploded. So uh, we're back to ground zero. I think that they probably will will consider uh, a special session or consider it next year. And I, I frankly welcome that because if they're going to, if they're going to talk about tax reform, it takes, the, it needs to be done in a more, uh, in a more robust, consistent fashion rather than rushing it through. And I think that, uh, I think that that is ultimately the reason that it imploded because the governor uh, and and both both of the houses had separate visions of uh, of a tax bill. So um, right now um, we do not have tax reform in the state. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, and the last thing I'll do before we move on to our next agenda item is to note that there was a comment in the Q and A. And uh, the gist of it is about forced uh, vaccinations or requiring vaccinations and um, the uh, resistance to that. Uh, well, do you want to answer that or uh, is it a question, Natalie? Or is it's it a comment. It's more or less a, it's more or less a comment. Just are, are they we were comforted? comfortable with forced vaccinations or requiring vaccinations. 
Well, you know, uh, the, the, the whole point, I guess, is this, is this, if, if, we, if we decide to vaccinate, to, to require all of our students to be vaccinated, uh, we will have to require both our faculty and staff to be vaccinated also. So I think that the question is whether we move to that uh, or not. And that will depend upon, uh, upon the recommendations of our health, uh, uh, of, of, of the folks in our health sciences center who have led us through this process. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on to our next agenda item, a presentation from David Addis. And David Addis comes to us from the EAB, which is an education consulting group. He's assisting um, in our academic transformation efforts. And um, his presentation will be about the case for change or um, why academic transformation is necessary at this time. David, are you ready? Thanks, Natalie. Yep, I will bring up my slides. And Natalie has a copy of these slides, uh, and so she's welcome to share them in whatever method you use to, uh, to share files. Um, I've used the title academic transformation because that is the phrase that you were using at West Virginia University. I'm gonna focus though on uh, some broader national trends rather than specifically on the process at West Virginia University. The provost spoke about that process and she shared a, a more detailed uh, framework. I'll talk about what's happening across the country uh, as institutions are facing both similar challenges and looking at some of the same kinds of approaches. Uh, I'll take um, uh, just under 20 minutes to share these comments and then I'll take uh, questions afterwards. So let me start by going back in time to December uh, 2019, where some of you will remember I was there on campus speaking to the West Virginia University Faculty Senate. Uh, I wish we had circumstances where I could be back on campus today. Uh, hopefully sometime in the not too distant future I can be. And there were five major points that I made well before COVID about some of the changes and trends that were uh, offering opportunities, but also challenges uh, for West Virginia University, but frankly for all land grant institutions and, and many others. The first was declining state support. We have seen that across almost every state uh, over particularly since the Great Recession that leads to greater tuition dependence. So as states give less money per student, uh, tuition becomes more important. And frankly, in most states, tuition has risen on a per student basis. So even public institutions are more dependent on tuition, which means they're much more dependent on enrollment, making sure students come and students stay. The second demographic point, which I think is becoming more familiar over time, is that there are anticipated to be fewer high school graduates, uh, both across most of the United States, but including in West Virginia. Already, we've seen major declines in New England and in the Midwest. Um, so as we see fewer high school graduates, and as you're both dependent more on tuition from those students, that increases competition. Um, so everyone is trying to get their a greater share of that shrinking pool of high school graduates. Uh, and as one person commented earlier in this meeting, we've seen pretty significant increases in applications to those elite institutions, uh, particularly now as many have gone test optional. Uh, they can uh, in sense, win that competition if they choose to expand their enrollments. The third is a greater student focus on return on investment. There is a broad, uh, although frankly somewhat major partisan uh, skepticism about the value of higher education. Uh, that's leading particularly students who are thinking more, they're spending more money, they're going into more debt. How will I get a return on this investment? Typically thinking about long-term salaries. Um, how much money will I earn or how successful will I be based on what I'm spending on this? Uh, and that leads to part of the aspect of competition. Um, uh, if I am a student looking at different options, I'm gonna be thinking very carefully about whether an institution or a specific program aligns with my career goals. Fourth, while we've seen a lot of growth in adult and online education, both for the purposes of increasing access uh, for working adults, but also frankly to grow enrollments at a time when traditional residential undergrads are shrink shrinking, we've seen a handful of institutions, I call them mega universities. You've heard their ads, right? This is the Arizona State Universities, Western Governors University, a lot of the for-profits, University of Phoenix. Uh, they have been growing dramatically and particularly in COVID, they have increased even faster than they were before. 
because they are phenomenally good and they make massive investments in marketing. Um, so when someone is thinking about, I'd like to take an online course, um, they hear an ad, uh, they see an ad online for those institutions, they might not see West Virginia University, for example, as their first choice because you're not spending a billion dollars the way the University of Phoenix is. And then finally, I won't focus on this today, there are also some pressures on the traditional individual investigator model of research, and more broadly, the financial model that undergirds the research university. So critical to the future of West Virginia University, how do we continue to invest in and subsidize research when we face financial pressures in other places? So that was the story before COVID. What we've seen since COVID has been an even greater pressure, particularly on enrollments. Um, so I'll just show you one quick summary. This is from the National Student Clearinghouse. They track student enrollments, uh, and they looked here at the change in enrollments uh, in fall 2019 and then in fall 2020. So fall 2020 was the big COVID impact. Here I'm just looking at first time beginning students. It turns out overall enrollments only fell by about 4% because a lot of returning students still returned. But we did see a lot of students who would have come as first time students sitting out. So about a 13% decline overall in first time beginning students, so undergraduate students. You can see, <coughs> excuse me, Public four-year students, oh, sorry, public four-year institutions saw about an eight percent decline overall. Um, some saw growth, some saw declines. The average is about eight percent. Private nonprofit four years, uh, almost an eleven percent decline. Significant growth in the private for-profits. Again, I mentioned they have been good at, particularly in a in an era of um, remote instruction, of uh, playing to their strengths, and they saw almost ten percent increase. The huge decline though was the public two years, a 20% plus decline in new students enrolling in community colleges. Um, this is a, a concerning for a range of different reasons, but overall what this means is that students who we think would have come to a uh, university uh, before COVID uh, sat out. The numbers are even steeper when we look at it by race and ethnicity. Um, so white and Asian students saw a decline, uh, but black students um, uh, um, and Latino students saw significantly larger declines, low income students even bigger declines. A lot of reasons for this. Uh, one, of course, is simply the impact of COVID, uh, the impact on jobs, the impact on health, the impact on communities. And we know that those are disproportionately experienced by communities of color, um, but also simply the fact that students were not face to face in their high schools meant that they didn't have support from their um, uh, counselors the way they might have in normal times. We saw FAFSA filing rates decline significantly. We are hopeful uh, that this fall will be better. Uh, Provost Reed just mentioned that you're down slightly, but certainly I think not down as much as you were before, but it's going to take quite some time to dig out of this hole. Uh, again, the long term impacts of COVID on finances, uh, on learning, uh, on support, on mental health, uh, it's going to take some time to get these students back into a college going mindset, uh, and I know that you're working on that as others are. But that means on top of those demographic challenges, there is that additional challenge now of uh, fewer students feeling supported or feeling willing or having the resources simply to come to a university. So in the face of that, we have academic transformation. How do we think about responding to these changes? And I created a simple template here um, on the horizontal axis, looking at changes over the short term, medium term, and long term. And on the vertical axis, things that are more incremental or status quo versus more transformational. And what I've tried to do here is I'm going to map out what are some of the common goals that universities are stating as I'm working with them on various aspects of transformation. The first, I think this was most common last spring, when a lot of institutions saw um, students who were leaving, uh, they were not paying room and board, uh, maybe even uh, unenrolling. There was a, a, a reduction in revenue, also an increase in costs in responding to COVID that led to budget deficits. Just about every institution had some level of budget deficit last spring and continuing to this year. So the first short term incremental approach is we've got to reduce that, that budget deficit. I'm going to focus uh, in this presentation on the academic side of things because from academic, academic transformation, there are, of course, changes that have to be made on the administrative side as well. So the first uh, uh, step was we've got a budget deficit. How can we reduce some of our academic costs? The next step, though, I think in thinking more about the medium term, so maybe three to five years was, OK, over the long term, it's not about reducing <laughs> the amount of money that we spend. 
That is, I don't know any university that aspires to spend less money in the future than it spends now. It wants to be efficient, it wants to be affordable, um, but that typically involves more resources, more resources for students, more resources for research, for outreach, for the mission. But one way to, to find those resources is through increased efficiency. So it's not about reducing costs, but becoming more efficient to free up resources to invest in priorities, whether that be um, student financial aid, uh, whether that be uh, new approaches to research, new academic programs, et cetera. The next approach that institutions are talking about, the next goal is we have to generate more revenue. That is, if we're finding that um, we might see a decline in traditional age students, we might see decline in traditional academic programs, how can we grow both existing programs and new academic programs to generate net revenue? Uh, and this might be at the undergraduate level, more commonly I'm seeing this kind of growth uh, at the graduate and professional level. Then one order higher than that is, what are those strategic priorities that we want to invest in? It's not simply enough to reduce our costs, balance our budget, become more efficient. We want to continue to expand our mission, to expand excellence, to invest in that. How do we decide what are those world-class strengths that we want to build? And so I would say that is a key aspect of transformation. Again, not simply about spending less money, but spending the money that we have in the areas where we'll have the greatest impact. And then over the long term, I'll say maybe five to 10 years, there are a lot of concerns about what you might call the business model for public higher education. Um, if the state is going to continue to give us less money per student, if students are reaching the, the limits of their ability to continue to pay more tuition, if the cost of research continues to rise, how are we going to create a model that allows us to be sustainable, to make those investments if we're not getting more revenues in? So institutions are talking about all of these. It's hard to address all of these at the same time. Some, particularly some of the really small institutions that are under huge duress are focused on the bottom left-hand corner. We gotta make the budget. Others that have more resources or more stability are thinking more about redesigning the business model long-term. I wanna talk though about the, uh, a common debate that I see on many campuses. I see a, a conflict that I hope to help resolve between two different arguments for taking on these kinds of activities. One I call the austerity argument. Uh, I lay it out in the bullets on the left-hand side here. This goes along the lines of, um, we've got a budget deficit. We have an obligation to reduce that budget deficit. We know that taxpayers and students aren't willing to fund us at the same level that they have historically, in part because they don't see a sufficient return on their investment. We can argue whether that's true or not, that's their perception. So we have to make some cutbacks, some cost savings, even if they might reduce our ability to provide comprehensive educational opportunities. So I'm thinking, for example, about a small liberal arts college that says, we have to cut our history major because we simply don't have enough money to, to, to support it anymore. We don't want to, but we have to. And this is often summarized by that argument, you can't be all things to all people. This is understandably something that I think really scares and frustrates faculty members, because it sounds like we're gonna have to sacrifice quality, sacrifice mission for the sake of, of limited funds. On the right-hand side, I lay out another argument I call the aspirational argument, which I think is probably a better way to engage faculty and engage the broader community, which says, first of all, we as a university are committed to bold strategic goals. Those goals will require significant new investments. Again, we have to spend money uh, on new programs, uh, hiring new faculty, uh, launching new programs, doing more research. But we don't anticipate that we're gonna get those new resources from our traditional sources. The state is not gonna give us significant new amounts of money. We can't charge undergraduates a lot more. We can't significantly grow our undergraduate population. Therefore, if we wanna make those bold investments, we have to make some difficult trade-offs. We have to think about the things we're currently doing, which ones have the highest impact, which ones are lower impact, maybe less aligned with mission. How can we realign some of those resources with those stronger strategic goals? Where I think there is a, um, a way to resolve this tension is that the actions that you would take under these two different arguments look pretty similar. That is, you might say, um, we're going to sunset an academic program that no longer aligns with student needs or with our mission. You could say, well, that sounds like an austerity argument. We can't afford the program anymore. I would say it also is an aspirational argument. We're not getting rid of the program because we want to spend less money. We're getting rid of the program because we want to invest in other, uh, in, in other more important uh, priorities for us. 
Now, I don't want to focus too much on, on cutting programs. We've seen institutions do that on the margins. It, it's rarely the most important thing they do. More important is looking at programs and saying, this program is not performing well. It's either not attracting students, it's not supporting students to great outcomes. How could we help that program do a better job? Uh, again, bringing in students, uh, better placing students, giving students better experience, better retaining students. Uh, and so a lot of that, that review of programs is going to look at uh, how we improve them so we can continue to bring in students and, frankly, bring in revenue. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead to this, this point here, common areas of opportunity. So as I've worked with a lot of institutions, there are common places they look to find those resources to out reallocate to higher priorities. So first would be looking at instructional costs. And there are a couple of areas here um, that I know you're starting to look at at West Virginia University, others have as well. The first would be, for example, unnecessary sections of multi-section courses. Hey, we offer 20 sections of Chemistry 101, but some of those sections are only half full. If we offered 15 sections, um, we could still meet all student demand, but we wouldn't have to hire some of those adjuncts that we've hired. That's probably relatively small savings in the case of one course, but over, the, over an entire large university like West Virginia University, that could be hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars that is now being spent in ways that I would argue are not significantly benefiting students. Similarly, if you have courses that are very small due to lack of demand or inaccurate course caps, rather than because they have to be small pedagogically, or courses that have high numbers of non-completers or repeaters, so high DFW rates, or even large variation instructor teaching loads. If you have some instructors who are teaching very few courses, well below what a standard load might be, others teaching well above that, that's not only an equity problem, that might be an efficiency problem. What if some of those underloaded instructors could be uh, teaching at a standard load? Would that allow us to then um, uh, reallocate those resources to other places? I also see institutions looking at academic unit overhead costs. So that could be um, colleges or schools within your university, or it could be departments. Those that are small tend to have higher overhead costs. Um, if you can combine them into larger units, you can reduce those overhead costs. Even more importantly, um, if you can bring units together that have significant curricular or research overlap, you can find even greater benefits. They can be more effective together than they are separately. And then finally, academic program costs. If you're looking at academic programs that have declining numbers of students, but their instructional costs are, are flat or rising, there's an opportunity to either um, bring those instructional costs down or find ways to bring in more students if there is demand for it, or simply academic programs that have poor student outcomes. So when other institutions talk about what you call academic transformation, what they're often looking to do is realign instructional resources with student needs. Notice I didn't say cut costs. What I said is, how do we take the resources that we already have and better align them with student demand or student needs? How could we potentially reorganize academic units for both efficiency and effectiveness? And then third, how could we review our academic program portfolio to make sure we're aligning our resources with our mission? Now, in some cases, if there's financial pressure, this might actually mean reducing costs. I would argue that's not the long-term strategy, but that might be necessary. The long-term goal is to find ways to reinvest in growth uh, and, in, um, and in mission. Um, running a little short on time, so I, I'm going to just touch on this briefly. Uh, I did a long webinar on program portfolio review. You're going through that right now. What are some of the biggest mistakes? Four major categories I'll just touch on. One is setting appropriate expectations. Typically, a program portfolio review is not going to save hundreds of millions of dollars. What it can do, though, is identify opportunities for growth and opportunities for reinvestment. Using data appropriately is critical, and, and, and the Provost Reed mentioned uh, Lisa Castellino has been working on pulling metrics so that you have the data that you need to look at that and understand where the opportunities are. But also you need to recognize that quantitative data will never capture all the important components that you need to know. There's always a qualitative component where you have to engage faculty in that program to understand it. And that's the third point. It's critical to engage faculty in these uh, decision-making processes, but it's also important, I found, not to ask faculty to take responsibility for these difficult decisions. It is unfair to ask a group of faculty to make the tough decision that might lead to the closure of one of their colleagues' programs or even potentially a reduction in staff. And then finally, it's important not to think of this as a one-time uh, action. 
um, you have to be or you should be reviewing programs every single year. I know you've got a new process to do that. Uh, I'm going to skip over that slide and talk. Actually, I'm going to skip to, sorry, I want to make sure we have time for questions. Uh, this is, the, I think, the most important point I want to make here. Uh, there is a, a process of looking at data, uh, of understanding what the trade-offs are. A critical component of that is not simply the immediate financial impact, but really changing the culture of decision making on campus. I often find on many campuses a fear, a concern that those um, quantitative um, uh, uh, factors will make all the decisions and faculty will not be included in the process. Okay, we've got a number, the number says this program goes or that course goes. What I've seen in the best cases is that um, creating that data literacy actually allows you to engage a broader set of stakeholders in the conversation. So once you start to create processes for routine evaluation of academic costs and opportunities, it suddenly becomes possible to enter into that dialogue. They're not simply decisions that are being made behind the scenes, they're now being made in public based on data and based on transparency. You can start to establish standards for using data and making those decisions, and even standards around things like course caps. I know you're talking about that, where right now there isn't really a standard. So different uh, units are making different decisions. Having some standards will allow for more engagement with what is an appropriate decision. Over time, this starts to improve the understanding across campuses of where are our institutional strengths, challenges, and opportunities. And that allows you to involve the campus community more broadly. Again, this means empowering people with data. Uh, it also means training them to be literate in that data and then creating venues in which they can talk about the meaning of that data and frankly argue about the meaning of that data. And so a key part of that, I believe, is increasing faculty input into strategic decision making. Doesn't mean that faculty will make all decisions, but that they will be involved, they will understand, and they will provide input into that decision. And that's a big role for the uh, Academic Transformation Advisory Committee that I've been working with. And then finally, um, uh, this will lead to better data practices, better data collection that in an ideal world, I think will empower everyone. So let me stop there. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and invite uh, questions or comments. Questions? I see Scott Fleming, Ron, go ahead. Thank you for that presentation. I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, I, as I look at the, the model for higher education, you know, it, it's a dated model. We're still based upon an agrarian calendar and everything. I, I wonder if we shouldn't also maybe look at being entrepreneurial to other institutions of higher education. You know, within our state and regionally, there's a lot of small and medium sized institutions, and they're going through the same process right now, except where we've got a class of 20 they've got a class of, of six. And so they're going to go through some rationalization. Have you seen any institution of higher education basically in a, in a crass manner sublet their intellectual capital to where if we are teaching a course, maybe we're teaching it live and online and we've got an extra 10 seats, we couldn't charge that institution for their students to maybe sit in on our class? And therefore, we start to reach capacity, we gain some money, uh, some money from those other institutions. And then we, uh, we sort of also put a hook into them for maybe our graduate programs. H have you seen anything like that? Yes, I have. Um, you know, one example is um, Purdue University. So, you know, Purdue University acquired a, a for-profit um, company, a for-profit university. They built this large online uh, offering of courses, and they're now partnering with some small liberal arts colleges to offer sometimes, a, say, a three plus two a bachelor's plus master's on the campus of the liberal arts college. So the liberal arts college can say, hey, you're here, you get the liberal arts experience at a small college, but you also get access to these great graduate programs at a discount with uh, remote instruction. I'm also seeing some other institutions think about um, collaborations in which, as you said, they're sharing courses through consortia. You have the scale, you have the capacity, and particularly now with COVID, as people are getting more comfortable with remote instruction, that makes it easier to, to do that uh, across a large uh, distance. Yeah, one of, the, one of the reasons why I point this out is I, I tend to have a lot of discussions with some of the leadership of the smaller, smaller colleges, 
And quite honestly, they make more money off a room and board than they do off of instruction. So if they could find a way to keep their people there and we want the numbers for our enrollment and then maybe get the bigger numbers if they come to our graduate programs, I, I think that's a way where we could uh, enhance some of the, the programs as we go through this transformation and look, look for areas, target these areas, see where we have our slack within the system and maybe try to, uh, to build up these different areas. But that's just my thought. I just wanted to ask your opinion. Yeah, I also like in terms of thinking about the ecosystem of higher education to shift away from a zero sum competition that student either comes to us or comes to them and find a way that those small institutions can continue to thrive uh, at the same time that you can partner with them rather than thinking we've got to get the student for ourselves and not for them. Yeah, David, um, just one, and Scott, I think that's a great question. I uh, just give you my Vanderbilt experience. Uh, so uh, Vanderbilt, though a relatively small institution, very complex with a huge medical science uh, program, um, engineering, et cetera. And so what I did is I went out and created a consortium of uh, small liberal arts colleges, Rhodes College, Davidson, um, uh, Birmingham Southern, et cetera. And, and we created these three plus two programs uh, where, where they do uh, three years on the liberal arts campus and then come and get engineering or, uh, or, or health sciences in some form or other. And it proved to be very, very successful and also a great way to recruit graduate students and a great way to, um, to uh, also get some of our PhD students to have an on-campus teaching experience at some of the smaller schools. So I think that, I, I think that the, the old day of, uh, of us being able to do everything under one, uh, under one umbrella, we are, the issue of partnerships is going to be, I think, the, the issue of the future in many ways. Another question for... David Addis, I see Dave Hauser. Go ahead. Yeah, Dave Addis, your, your last comment sort of crystallized my question for me, I think. Uh, you said it's not a zero sum game. And I'm actually wondering to what degree that's true, or if you could speak more of that. The demographic and, and societal changes that are reducing the number of students coming to college is what's driving the, the movement towards transformation. If everybody transforms, aren't we kind of still all in the same boat, right? That, that you know, we, we still, we're just kind of kicking the can down the road because everybody's a little bit better. See, my kid, my kid's even concerned about this, right? Um, but like, so you see what I'm getting at here, right? Is, is if everybody transforms and takes your advice, then, then don't we still have the same issue of fewer students and colleges chasing fewer students to sustain the tuition that they need to pay their bills? Yeah, I think that's if you take the perspective that the supply of students is determined by the number of 18 year olds or the number of new high school graduates, there is a, a real limit to that and that's going to decline. But if you think about all those students, for example, who started a college degree and didn't finish it, um, uh, there are you know, much larger numbers of working adults who have some college but no degree. There are plenty of people who have a bachelor's degree who might be interested in either a master's degree or some sort of additional credential. And so I think that's where we're going to start to see that shift is uh, the, those traditional residential 18-year-olds are, for, particularly for the small liberal arts college, absolutely fundamental. But, you know, for an institution like West Virginia University, I can imagine diversifying, finding other ways to engage students, recognizing that the, the demand for higher education is much larger than the number of 18 year olds. Okay, uh, one more question and then we're going to So Marianne, uh, Derek, go ahead, please. Uh, to that point of diversifying our, our task, I don't know if there's any programs who are doing this currently, but I'd really, really like to see in this area specifically targeting those who are moved out of the coal mining and uh, energy workforce who may be willing to come back to school for training in other jobs areas. And I don't know if we've really targeted that group or which colleges maybe are targeting that group. Yeah, does anyone else on the line have information about that? Well, I, I can respond that yes, we are, we're looking at a lot of different kinds of retraining programs. One of the things that uh, we are putting a tremendous amount of emphasis on right now is getting broadband throughout the state. Uh, that's both a 
state and national priority. And once we are able to do that, then we'll have the ability to be able to reach into every home and, and do a number of things we're not able to do right now. But our Beckley campus, as an example, is really the uh, the front door door to the uh, to the southern coal fields, and uh, that's been one of its major major goals is to uh, is to get people who um, who uh, have lost their positions in in mining, but to um, to be able to be retrained. The other thing is that um, is that as we take a look at uh, at small manufacturing, we happen to have a tremendous number of folks who are very well trained in. Um, in skills that require um, manufacture or that, that are manufacturing based. And, uh, and I know that we're looking at how we can get uh, further engagement of these folks in developing new opportunities. For example, we have NASA here and they, they, they need a lot of small, man, they, they need a lot of very skilled manufacturing uh, help. And we can do that right here in the state. And we haven't ever thought about that up to this point. Okay, thank you. I, uh, I know there might be other questions. Um, I, uh, if you have additional questions, I encourage you uh, to send those questions to me or you can send them to the uh, chair of the uh, Academic Advisory Committee, Ashley Martucci. Um, and, uh, and we'll make sure that, uh, that David Addis gets them. And, uh, and I've got a copy, as he mentioned, uh, I have a copy of the slides that I can share with folks more widely as well as posting it on the Faculty Center website. Uh, but, uh, so thank you, David, uh, very much for your presentation. Um, we still have quite a lot to get through, so um, let's, let's move on. So next is my report. Um, a few Everly senators reached out to me after the ballot for new senators was distributed last month. And they were concerned that the ballot ha only had representation from four departments um, and uh, was dominated by nominees in one department in particular. Uh, given the senators' concerns, the uh, Senate executive leadership looked further into the, um, the uh, election balloting process. So uh, Emily Murphy, Ashley Martucci, and Judy Hamilton and I met and we took a look at the most recent nomination balloting data. And, um, and from that data, we were able to con conclude a few things. In Eberly, uh, only a few departments nominated faculty. So there were several departments that had no nominations at all. And, um, and so that one do department dominated the ballot because there was low participation across Eberly. Uh, but from our examination, we also concluded that we need to do a better job of advertising or, or making faculty aware of the opportunity to become a senator. Um, and we also need to make balloting a little more clear and transparent. So for example, candidates who appear on the ballot um, are the folks who have the most nominations. So just because one person nominates you um, doesn't mean that you'll uh, appear on the ballot. You, uh, there has to be more than one person nominating you. So um, in addition, over the next few months, we'll be looking at how other universities hold Senate elections to see if there are um, other processes, other, other, other and better processes we might adopt. Uh, and I just have one more item uh, to update you on. And that is that uh, Serena Matsunaga and Sally McMillan from Torchstar Education, which is another consulting company um, and Evan Witters will be presenting at the May Faculty Senate meeting to discuss the student success initiatives that are part of um, the university strategic transformation plans. And actually uh, what, what they'll present kind of dovetails nicely off of, off of what David shared with us is particularly with some of those um, uh, efficiencies or savings that the uh, institution has started to work on. Are there any questions for me? Okay, we will be moving on. So next to our two candidates for Senate chair elect, Scott Wayne and Melena Bernstein will be sharing their statements. They each have three minutes to speak. Uh, the faculty secretary, David Hauser, will time the candidates and let them know when their three minutes are up. Uh, the candidates are listed in the order in which they will speak. And uh, that order was determined by random drawing. So Scott Wayne is up first. Scott, are you ready? I am. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I'm Scott Wayne. I'm a professor, uh, associate professor in mechanical and aerospace engineering in the Statlitz College. Uh, I've been at WVU for 24 years, uh, beginning as a research faculty member and then as a tenured faculty member. 
uh, as far as uh, experience for faculty senate or for the senate chair, a uh, long serving member of the faculty welfare committee uh, that addresses a lot of issues of interest to faculty and some of the more significant ones that we've worked on over my tenure on that committee is the parental uh, work assignment policy and alternative work assignment policies that allow faculty to modify their work assignments after birth or adoption of a child or other family situations. Um, worked for many uh, years on the dependent tuition benefit program that is now in place. Formation of the uh, ombudsperson office as a resource for faculty. Uh, a lot of the board of governors policies or rules that we put in place as WVU uh, gained uh, more autonomy from the Higher Education Policy Commission. I think that would be important experience going forward as we start to implement some of the uh, changes in our academic transformation. I've been a member of the Tobacco Free Campus Working Group, still serve as a faculty senate representative on the Tobacco Free Campus Steering Committee. Uh, I'm chairing the Research Integrity Committee uh, and a current member of Senate Executive Committee. Um, so I have a wide range of experience uh, relevant to chairing the Faculty Senate Committee. I think going forward that academic transformation uh, not just this current iteration, but will be a continuing uh, effort on campus uh, to make sure our programs are relevant, that they're exceptional, uh, that they're valued by the students and that the students get a, um, a rewarding uh, educational experience, uh, regardless of the mode that we're delivering our courses going forward. So I intend to make sure that the faculty have a continued voice uh, and continued input throughout that process of uh, transformation and implementation. Um, and uh, I'm honored to have been nominated uh, as a uh, Senate chair candidate and would be honored to serve and we work uh, very hard to uh, um, advance the mission and goals of our institution. Thank you, with one minute to spare, excellent. Okay, so now, uh, now we'll hear from Elena Bernstein, who is our second candidate for chair elect. Elena, Thanks, you Emily. Yep. It. Greetings all, I'm Elena Bernstein. I'm a service associate professor in the Counseling and Learning Sciences Department in the College of Education and Human Services. I've worked at WVU since 2009, and this is my second year for serving on the Faculty Senate. I am the inaugural director of the PhD program in learning sciences and human development. We're in our second year and running strong. In addition to my work with doctoral students, I work with undergraduates in teacher education, developing and teaching courses and learning theories for future teachers. And some of you may know me as a sort of qualitative methodologist for hire around town. <laughs> I'm brought onto projects across campus to help researchers develop instruments for understanding research participants' experiences and perspectives be they teachers, um, women battling opioid epidemic, student athletes of color, West Virginia fighter fighters. All of my work, research, teaching, and service broadly engages ideas about learning, about culture, and about understanding diverse perspectives. And if elected, I bring these areas of expertise to the role of faculty senate chair. In my candidate statement, I tried to communicate what I see as two core functions of the chair. And I hope that that statement, however brief, successfully communicated this message. First, that a chair should represent the full breadth of diverse voices and experiences of faculty at WVU. My work across the university in sustained collaborations among many different colleges and units, I think has positioned me well to both appreciate the great diversity of experiences at WVU and cultivate meaningful lines of communication across them. The nature of our research, our teaching, and our service is really very varied. And if I'm to serve as your chair, I'd be starting from an appreciation of how our work shapes our perspective on issues, the different stakes we may have in different policies, and our differing priorities for the institution. I hope that having this appreciation will help me facilitate productive dialogue amongst us as senators, promote greater appreciation for one another's work and perspectives, and ensure that when I represent the Senate to others, I do so in a way that feels truly representative. Second, a chair should be an effective liaison between the Senate and university leadership. So having a deep appreciation for the varied interests represented in the Senate only goes so far 
unless I'd be able to effectively communicate those diverse interests and needs to our leadership. In the last several years, working with the provost office in a range of capacities, I've grown increasingly confident and I think skilled at advocating for faculty concerns, while I'll say at the same time, trying to understand the multifaceted challenges that our leadership faces. As an institution, we're clearly at a pivotal moment where our leadership is promoting substantial um, institutional transformation. This seems like a crucial time when the voice of faculty must be authentically present and prioritized in conversations about that transformation. I believe I've cultivated relationships and honed my skills as a liaison in ways that will ensure that I can effectively advocate for us. So I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Uh, so thanks very much, uh, Melina and Scott. Uh, folks, ballots will be distributed tomorrow, I think at noon. And uh, a general announcement uh, about the uh, uh, results, the election results will be made at the May meeting. But of course, I will let the, uh, the candidates know uh, well before. So as soon as the ballots close and we count votes, I'll let you guys know. Okay. So next, uh, moving on, is a report from the chair of the curriculum committee, Jennifer Steele. Jennifer, it looks like you're ready. Hey, I'm ready to go. So I have uh, five items for approval today and two information items. So the um, approval items are Annex 1, new courses, Annex 2, course changes, Annex 3, capstone courses. Then we have a certificate in early childhood administration and program changes to the BA in geography. So I'm happy to take any questions about those items. Okay, so we will combine the five four approval items into a single votable measure. So all those in favor of approving Annex 1, the new course report, Annex 2, the course changes report, Annex 3, the capstone courses report, uh, their certificate and early childhood administration and the program changes to the BA in geography, please raise your hand. And closing the vote. Dave, can you record the number of, yeah, very good, thank you. Okay, Julie, can you clear hands? Uh, any opposed? Okay. Um, Calling the votes. Okay, very good. So uh, all of the annexes are approved. Okay, so I have two information items then. Um, changes to the minor in arts management, um, and then the grad prog excuse me, grad programs report. So these are the programs passed by grad council. So we have the executive doctor of business administration, MS in resource economics and management, MM to MA in music theory, and MS in human resource leadership. Any questions about the four information items? Okay, moving on. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, moving on to our General Education Foundations Committee report. Lisa D. Bartolomeo is chair. Are you ready, Lisa? I am Madam Chair. We have today only one course for approval, um, the AVIA 150 Intro to Meteorology being approved for Jeff 2B. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions for Lisa? Okay. All those in favor of approving Annex 5, please raise your hand. OK, 
Okay, I'm closing the vote. Okay, Julie, can you clear hands? Are there any opposed? Okay, I'm closing the vote. All right, Annex 5 is approved. Next is a Teaching and Assessment Committee report from Chair Jessica Vanderhoff. Jessica, are you ready? Yes, thank you, Natalie. Um, so there's no formal report this month, just a couple of updates. Um, the first is that with regard to the early semester teaching assessment, the uh, assessment closed for the second eight week semester on April 4th. So at our May meeting, I will plan to share a report of um, participation um, for the full semester. Um, looking at just the first eight week term and the full 16 week term, we had over 700 courses participate um, in that early semester teaching assessment. Uh, the second, um, just update, um, we have finalized at the committee level um, revisions to the ESCI complaint form. So just to familiarize or update everyone, um, prior to this year, uh, a complaint form existed for uh, faculty who wanted to report um, inappropriate comments um, on their ESCIs. Um, that initial workflow only looked at violations of the student code of conduct. Um, and uh, at the request of faculty, um, the workflow was not comprehensive. And so now the workflow will address both those, the feedback that violates the student code of conduct as well as other um, just inappropriate or inconsistent language. And so, um, as I said, the committee has finalized those revisions. It'll go to exec at the end of this month, and then hopefully we can share that workflow and related documents um, at the May meeting. And that's all I have to share, and I'm happy to take any questions. Questions? Okay, thank you, Jessica. Next, we have a report from our faculty representative to state government, Roy Nutter. Roy, are you ready? I am, thank you, Natalie. Roy Nutter, um, Statler College, and uh, your ACF rep. The most interesting weekend of the year occurred all day on Saturday with the legislature. Um, you, uh, were into that, and I was. It, it just totally consumed me, but the outcome was not much, as usual, probably. The uh, budget passed, as uh, President Gee noted. Um, the only other thing that um, you probably would like to know about, the ACF met on Friday, and um, they are interested in international studies. So what they're looking at is support from the legislature to assist in international students coming to West Virginia. They're, I think, at the very beginnings of this, but um, they're looking at trying to get the legislature to support it either through a joint resolution or a bill next year. Um, they waited until mid-term this spring before beginning. So uh, the only choice they will have is to work toward next year. So FYI, for those of you in international studies, I can uh, connect you with the people that are interested. That concludes my report. Thank you. Are there questions for Roy? Thanks. Next, we will hear a Board of Governors report from Stan Heilman. Stan, are you ready? 
Yes, ma'am. Um, we have not met since the last faculty center meeting, so I don't really have a report. Our next meeting is April 23rd. Hopefully it's going to be in person. I really hope it is. So um, I will be back with a report from that one. Okay, very good. Uh, so next we um, have a four approval item resolution to create academic uh, to create an academic technology committee. And I am going to um, kick it over to Dave Hauser, our secretary to uh, introduce this, or talk further about this item. Thanks, Natalie. Um, so uh, this is Annex 6 on the agenda. This has actually come up before and then was punted off uh, as it had to go back for some minor revisions. This was a proposal by a, a working group to kind of uh, create a new standing committee that would look at academic technology issues across the board. Uh, by making it a standing committee, it gives it the ability to kind of exist for longer periods uh, and to sort of deal with the ebb and flow of, of, of change at the university and then report back both to the Senate and the provost office as necessary to sort of uh, authorize changes. Again, this is new, so the committee has a very broad agenda to sort of look into whatever it wants to, uh, to, start to try to make good recommendations for moving us forward in the right way. Again, this is just a resolution to create a committee to move forward. Okay, question about the resolution. Okay. So all those in favor of approving Annex 6, please raise your hand. Okay, closing the vote. Julie, can you fill in hands? Any opposed? Okay, closing the vote. Okay, so uh, as Annex 6 carries and uh, we have a new standing committee. Very good. Um, the last item before new business is the re uh, results of the faculty senate election. And are there any questions about um, uh, about Annex Seven? The results. Okay. Is there any new business? I see one hand. All right, Parviz Pomori, go ahead. Hi, uh, Parviz Pomori from Stadler College, and I'm <clears throat> glad to see um, President Guy is online. So, you know, in this uh, every year we had this uh, Christmas um, gathering of faculty senators, and in your blamey place. And, and this year we didn't, and you were passionate. And, and I think um, after the commencement, it's only a suggestion, after the commencement, it might be a good idea. You have a big parking lot that, you know, we bring to people together and, and just, um, I'm not gonna hug anyone, but <laughs> just uh, take that into consideration. There is no motion and thank you. Yeah. We need to come together. Yeah. Well, thank you, Paris. I appreciate that. And we do need to celebrate more, so we'll find out a way to do that, okay? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Any other new business? Hearing no new business, no additional business. Is there a motion to adjourn? Oh, I see many. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Can you clear those hands? Can you clear those hands, um, Julie? Because I need to see if there's a second. Is there a second? Okay, very good. Thanks, everyone.
See you next time. <laughs>